This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. Uh, welcome to the International Association for the Study of the Commons First World Commons Week 24 hour noon webinar series as we are at 10 o'clock in Rome, all the church bells are ringing. <laughs> so you have joined the noon UTC minus eight, uh, Rome time, 10 p.m. Uh, East, Eastern US time, 4 p.m. And my name is Bia Diaz, and I'm one of the mod moderators that from the 24-hour webinar series uh, from the Univers University of Massachusetts. And I'm really delighted to introduce you to Javier Bazurto, and he's going to be presenting uh, his webinar on perspectives on fishing, uh, fishing commons governance, research, and policy. In in the interest of like going straight to the talk, I just want to give some uh, ground rules for the webinar. We'll, our speaker gonna have a 35 minute maximum of uh, talk. And after that, I will have 10 minutes for questions from the audience. And I'm gonna give a warning in five, five minutes left to the talk. So the, for the attendees, we are please uh, asking you to use the Q&A box to make your questions. And also for everybody that's joining us through the phone, uh, for, through the phone you can just uh, type star nine and then you're gonna raise your hand function and I can unmute you in order so you can uh, ask the questions. So now, um, please Javier, you can start, thank you. Okay, thank you, Bia. Um, my name is Javier Basurto again. I'm an associate professor at Duke University, and I'm going to be talking about uh, perspectives on fishing commons governance. Uh, the work we do at our Coast and Commons Collab that I direct at Duke University has to do mostly with how people use uh, or interact with, with marine and coastal environments and how they they govern those environments. So, so I'm going to share a little bit of the work uh, we've been doing and the work that others have been doing as well, and and some policy perspectives in relation to governance of small scale fisheries. So, so the, the way I prepared this talk, or the goal of this talk, is to provide students and practitioners interested in studying fisheries as commons a general glance. Um, of some trends uh, in, in re that we see, that I see in research and policy in relation to, to governance of small scale fisheries. So, so here we go. Uh, I think first to set the stage is very important to, uh, to show you a graph that is well known in, among people that study and work with, with fish, because um, fish is a common pool resource. This is an over, over time um, figure about the catch or the production of capture fisheries and aquaculture production in blue um, over time, as, it's, as I said, in terms of millions of tons. And this, this comes from the most recent uh, SOFIA, which is uh, one of FAO's flagship publications. SOFIA stands for the State of World and Fisheries Aquaculture and Aquaculture, the State of the World Fisheries and Aquaculture. And as it's well known, uh, the fisheries production has plateaued since the late 1980s, while aquaculture production has uh, continues to increase. But for us that study commons, some important questions as are who fishes, uh, how, how is the fishing done, uh, and who benefits, among other questions of interest to, to common scholars. Another, another graph uh, that is important to, to, to visit, to see, is how the production is split in terms of what it goes to food, uh, which can be for human consumption or not, and what goes for non-food uses, what part of the catch. And, and so the food is the bars, the, the larger bars in darker blue, the non-food uses are the lighter and shorter, smaller bars. 
And um, as you can tell, uh, the production for food, again, human or non-human, has continued to increase over time. Um, the orange line is population, steadily increasing. And the red line is apparent consumption. That is consumption for, um, for, for humans, and it's derived from, the, from FAO's food balance sheets. Uh, and it's, it's done in a complex way, and we can talk about it later. But, but this is what goes for, for human consumption. But I guess we don't know who's, who's doing the fishing. And I want to tell you a little bit about who's doing the fishing. And, and among fishing, you can, you can see two, two extremes. On the one hand, um, we could categorize fishing as large scale, uh, like these big boats that are catching tuna or shrimp on on the picture on the lower right. Uh, but on the other extreme, and sometimes it's not useful to categorize fishing in this two, two in, in a dichotomous ways, because there's a lot of variation between these two extremes. On the one side, large scale, and then the other, small scale. On the small scale, uh, fishers are using less technology. They are, um, they have a different characteristics at long, larger scale. And in this talk, I'll be focusing mostly on small scale fishing. So why small scale fisheries and what are small scale fisheries? So why small scale fisheries? Well, this, this fishing has been a forgotten commons for a long time. What I mean by that is that most policy around the world that has been um, crafted and that is in place has been developed thinking on large-scale fisheries for the most part, and large-scale fisheries in the Western world. Well, we know from preliminary research that over 90% of, of all fishers and fish workers uh, participate in small-scale fisheries. Most of them are based in developing countries, not in the Western world, and at least half are women. Uh, and in this activity participate many occasional fishers and fish workers that in other times of the year they are tending to their fields or they're doing all their activities to sustain their livelihoods. And so given the amount of people that are involved, uh, it's striking that this has been a forgotten commons for, for a long time. And it's thought that another important role besides economics that this, this activity plays um, is in terms of food security and poverty alleviation. They, they, it, it's thought that they might be doing important contributions to food security and poverty alleviation because sometimes part of the catch is, is stays to, to feed the family. And so the graph that we have on the right, is just shows that it's a comparison between large scale and small scale. Uh, on the left side, you have the amount of people in green that participate in small scale fisheries compared to those that participate in large scale that are in, in red or, or pink. And on the right side, you have catch, the, the fish that you see in green and, and that you see in red. Uh, they're the catch in, in both, you know, large scale and small scale are more, it's more balanced, but what is strikingly different is the amount of, of fish that you see in darker pink or darker green that are discards. Those are the fish that are wasted in one form or the other. And in industrial fisheries, it's thought that there's mo many more discards than in small scale. This is a, um, a visually attractive way of, of showing how many more labor participates in, in small scale fisheries than in large scale fisheries. It compares one trip of the world's largest fishing trawler. A fishing trawler is a, it's a boat that trolls the bottom for fish produces as much as 7,000 traditional African fishing boats per year. So again, this is just to show, give you a sense of the, of the differences and the importance to better understanding how small scale fisheries are governed. But it's, and, and finally show you uh, the importance uh, of small scale fisheries when it's compared to other uh, sectors, uh, economic sectors of the ocean. And it turns out that this type of fishing is the is the largest employer in the ocean when so the the ring in blue that you see on the left uh darker blue are the amount of uh jobs in millions 120 million jobs that are, that are small scale fisheries are thought to provide compared to other sectors which might be include 
um, shipping, tourism, oil and gas, uh, other sectors that are activities that produce em employment to other people in the ocean. In green, again, it's a comparison between the amount of jobs provided by small scale fisheries compared to the amount of jobs industrial fisheries in, in, in yellow or, or orange. And the, the box, the rectangular is, is the distribution of those small scale fisheries, fishers that are working in coastal or marine and inland. Because there's a lot of fishing that takes place in the, in the large lakes in, in Africa, like, like Victoria, um, yeah, mostly in Africa and in Asia. Okay, so, so what are small scale fisheries? That, that's a complex and, and question as well, because it's such a diverse activity that in fact, scholars have agreed that one definition is it's problematic. Providing one definition of what are small scale fisheries will not capture the diversity of, of activities and ways of fishing that um, encompasses the term or the concept of small scale fishing. So let me explain it like this instead. Uh, first, for most of society's Moscow fisheries have been invisible. Uh, that's what it, they've been. And they've been invisible because they're diverse, as I mentioned, but they're also decentralized and very dynamic. And what, what do I mean by these terms? By diverse, I mean that fishers are fishing many different species. In other words, they're interacting with several commons all the time at the same time. They're not only fishing for one species. In the same fishing trip, they're fishing three or four or five different species that might be tailored to different markets and different consumers. Uh, they're decentralized in the sense that many of these activities happen in isolated communities with very little interaction with, with central governments or, or their local government. And so for me, these are the quintessential example of a self-governance self governance arrangements. And in, in my lab, that's why we've taken an interest on small-scale fisheries, because we're very interested in how self-governance takes place, how people can self form arrangements to interact with the ocean which is a very complex medium to interact with. You cannot see what's under um, many, many other reasons. And finally, uh, these are, our activities are culturally embedded. They take, place in a, uh, they take place in a particular geography where this, the interaction with the ocean is taking place in, in conjunction with the social norms of that place. So these are not only economic activities, these are social and cultural activities. And finally, they're very dynamic because the ocean is very dynamic. It's changing all the time and the fishers are very well adapted to change with that, with, with the environment they're interacting. So for all those reasons, it's very complex to collect data to do research about this, this type of commons. And it's well known that these are, or is thought that these are uh, data poor systems. And in fact, for, to, for governments, it becomes very challenging to collect very, very basic data about the systems in a systematic way. In addition to all these challenges, we need to think of small-scale fisheries not as a singular sector, as industrial fisheries are. Small-scale fisheries are not only fishing, because fishers are not only fishing, but there might be farming part of the year or, or obtaining resources from forests. Um, and so fishing can be the interaction of all these sectors, including subsistence and commercial, because sometimes fishers are fishing to eat or, or to sell, uh, or both. Anyway, to finalize uh, <clears throat> these types of these different types of activities, small scale and industrial, create very different equity distributional and environmental effects. On the left side, and this I took this figure from a book from Berkey's and, and co-authors. Uh, on the left side, you have a typical large-scale fishery, which all the boats are based in one major urban development, which is the black dot. It, the fleet might be 10 large vessels. They might catch 1,000 metric tons of catch. Um, so they're exploding one large fish stock. So the government creates, maybe with their help, um, one fishery management plan. Well, small-scale fisheries, uh, oops, there might be six or seven different rural villages that are exploiting, uh, that each of them has their own fleets, 
They might be all catching the same amount as this large-scale fishery example, but they might be exploiting 10 different small fish stocks, and therefore it might be required to have 10 different fishing, fisheries management plans. So that's just to give you an example why it's difficult to not only to collect data about small-scale fisheries, but to create policy and management and ultimately govern themselves uh, for whatever purpose uh, it's determined it might be important. And for us, an interest in studying governance, understanding governance um, contributes to the challenge as well. So, so as part of being, um, but fortunately we have a lot of, of theoretical and methodological tools that Lynn Ostrom developed in her own study of, of, of the commons. And in my own work and the research that we do at our lab at, at Duke, we've used this work as a basis to, the, to increase our understanding of, of governance of small scale fisheries. And so last year we produced a report uh, where we tried to summarize a little bit some initial um, assessment of the theory and practice in relation to governance and small scale fisheries. And to do this, and, and, and you can download this report, by the way, if you go to our website, um, Coast and Commons Collaboratory at, at Duke. So what we did, we, we looked at the literature that was a starting point. We created a very large uh, library of articles on small scale fisheries. And then we looked at them systematically to see how people were talking about governance. In other words, we started with a discourse analysis of how, and, and a discourse analysis is just a way to understand how people are interpreting and, and creating categories of, of what they are, the way they're they're conceptualizing uh, whatever topic they're interested on. Um, and, and here it has to do with ethics because ethics allows us to understand or ask questions like why scientists choose to describe issues the way they do. So we started with analysis and analysis uh, of this sort where we start questioning, well, how have people conceptualized small scale, how have people that study governance conceptualized small scale fisheries? And to give you an example of this, this picture, um, it's a very typical example of fishing or the way we think about the word fishing. Fishing takes place in a boat, usually by two males. Um, but the labor that these women are doing by preparing breakfast or food for, for their husbands before they go to fish that is going to allow them to fish for longer and, and stay on the boat, this hidden labor isn't this part of fishing? Shouldn't we think about fishing beyond harvesting? Um, and so this course analysis start, allows us to start questioning um, issues like this. Or, or what about these activities, uh, the woman, this woman in Palau um, that is on the left, that is post-processing the fish that her husband brought, isn't this fishing as well? So activities that happen after harvesting, um, should we think of them as fishing as well, or the or the women taking the small fish to the market in in Senegal, as the picture on the right uh, shows? Um, why is this not thought about fish as as fishing? We also, as part of this study, we looked at what practitioners are doing. So we conducted a number of interviews um, with a number of of practitioners that range from those that act work at the global level, like the World Bank. Um, FAO and, and others, philanthropic foundations that work regionally or nationally, and, and fishing organizations like the World Forum of Fish Harvesters and, and Fish Workers. Um, a diverse, diverse set of practitioners, including some members in academia. Um, and we asked them what, what they're doing in relation to small scale fisheries. And finally, we conducted a document analysis um, where we focused on understanding how much funding and, and where is the funding going in relation to small scale fisheries as part of understanding how they're governed. We also were invited to participate uh, and understand how uh, the World Forum of Fish Harvesters and Fish Workers, which is one of two global um, organizations of small scale fisheries, fishers, 
um, we were in, in, invited to, to one of their general assemblies to um, be observers and understand how these processes of governing themselves uh, take place. So this research um, that we report in that we, yeah, that you can find the report more extensively is, is what I'm going to be talking uh, today just a little bit about. So, so when, where, and how have scientists studied small scale fisheries? First, this is just a graph showing over time the number of articles published on small scale fisheries. And you can see that in the early 2000s, there was a huge spike uh, in interest on small scale fisheries. And the number of articles is increasing. And I think this is true in many disciplines, but in small scale fisheries is definitely um, pretty remarkable. Uh, we see where we we looked at where those articles are coming from. There's a broad interest in in Asia, Latin America, Africa. Uh, so there's a lot of people studying small scale fisheries in many different parts of the world. So what did our what did we focus our discourse, anal discourse analysis of governance in in specific? Well, first we want to understand how scientists, how social science scholars, how people that study governance have thought about what is the problem, how people are conceptualizing what is the problem to be solved, what is the governance problem. Um, it could be over exploitation, uh, it could be the need to control access to fishing areas, um, the conflicts that come with establishment of marine protected areas, it could be commercialization, not having traceable chains of um, chain of custody, etc. So what did we see? Uh, first, uh, we did this over time. So, so in this time period, 50s to 80s, the problem was conceptualized of being one of under-exploitation. And the proposed solution was to modernize the fleets. Later on, we see that in the 80s to 2000s, it was a problem of over-exploitation. And the problems, the, the solution was, you know, to assign property rights, etc. In the 90s to 2000s, it was a problem of conflict and the need was to address the con conflicts. So we also looked at what uh, researchers looked was the goals of governance. In the, in the 60s to 2000s, uh, the goals of governing small scale fisheries was uh, to develop them. And the outcome sought was an efficient use of resources, an efficient use of marine resources. Later on, the goal of governing small scale fisheries was to provide income and benefits to people in their communities. And the outcome sought was equity, human rights, and a balance with social cultural values. And most recently, the goal of governing small scale fisheries is for environmental conservation. And the outcome is to protect the ecosystem. So, so we see that people have studied and have thought about the goals of governance um, has shifted over time. What have been the dominant forms of governance have also shifted from top-down command and control, cooperatives, co-management, and more recently private-like property rights. We also learned that the scientific literature it has influenced um, in, in big way the, the, the international policy instruments that have been published in the last 30 years, like Agenda 21, the World Conference on Sustainable Development, and most recently, the Small Scale Fishery Guidelines, of which I'll come back in a second. What we don't see in the literature is gender, people talking about gender. We don't see uh, researchers looking at fishers as agents of change. Governments are talked about as agents of change, um, civil society organizations, but fishers are not talked enough. Uh, so self-governance doesn't quite figured um, enough in the literature. And fisheries are, small scale fisheries are not talked about social policy. They're talked about it as environmental policy, but not a social policy, when this is more of a social activity. Very quickly, the types of support being provided to small scale fisheries that we saw through our interviews to, to practitioners is that philanthropies are mostly focusing on working at the very local level or with academic organizations. With, by local level, I mean local civil society organizations, CSOs. Government aid agencies work at the national level, of course, and with some fishing organizations. And intergovernmental and finance organizations definitely work more at the regional and national level. 
in terms of funding, this is not research that we did, but we were able to, to look at. Uh, this is a graph that on the left side shows in gray, total marine foundation giving. This is mostly in terms of philanthropic organizations um, around the world, but in terms of millions of dollars from that total marine foundation, uh, foundation giving, uh, only five to 12%, which is the, the proportion in yellow, is what is thought to go to small scale fisheries. Most of it either goes to marine protected areas and other kind of, of marine conservation um, um, yeah, goals. Um, so that's how it looks like in terms of funding for small scale fisheries. So let's now try to connect a little bit science and, and practice. Uh, how people are talking about what is working. Uh, people think that in general, um, local fisheries require local approaches. And that is talked about whether you, you know, you label your work as being from based in co-management, com community-based management, territorial user rights management, self-governance, decentralization, decentralization, all these um, uh, scholars working in these different areas agree that empowerment of fishers and their local solutions is 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 an important part of the the answer to better governance. We also were able to identify opportunities um, available. One of them is that there's international policy instruments and platforms that have been developed um, solely for small scale fisheries. And that's the small scale fisheries guidelines. And I'll talk about them in a second. But also there are organized fishers uh, out there with different levels of capa uh, capability and capacity um, that, that haven't been interacting with, with a diversity of actors of society as, as they probably could to strengthen their, their capacities. And finally, there is a very um, active network of researchers called TBTI, too big to ignore, for those of you that are not familiar with, with, with it. Um, here's, here's their portal, and they've been in, in organizing a global conference in Moscow Fisheries that is actually happening in a week and a half in Thailand, um, so very soon. So let's go to the guidelines. What are the small scale fisheries guidelines? Well, first, um, as I said, is the only negotiated uh, international instrument entirely dedicated to small scale fisheries. Um, and so it's, and by, by negotiated, uh, I'll, I'll come back to what I mean by negotiated, but the other important element of it is that it goes beyond fishing. It looks as fishing as social policy. You know, it brings together social development and responsible fisheries and, and brings, and it complements other international instruments uh, that you see on the right, like responsible governance of tenure, um, uh, the code of conduct on responsible fisheries. It, it, it is grounded in a human rights, um, in human rights principles. Uh, so, so it looks at, at, at small scale fishing, not only as harvesting, but those other activities that have been hidden uh, from the way we think about fishing. So it's a very promising instrument. Um, and right now the, the agenda is to figure out and to engage in the implementation of it, which it's, it's not an easy task, of course. Uh, it's a very inter interesting instrument too, because it was, as I was saying, it was negotiated and by negotiated, um, there was a very extensive consultation process that took place around the world. So there's a lot of buy-in and, and when I've been working with um, fishing organizations, they, they, didn't, they don't see this instrument as, as belonging to FAO. Uh, it's an instrument that belongs to them. And that's a very important first step, the ownership of this ins international instrument. Some of the guiding principles um, are here, but this gives you a sense of how broad and diverse this instrument is in terms of the things that things we should be paying attention when we govern small scale fishing, right? The rule of law, transparency, social responsibility and feasibility, gender, social and economic viability, equity and equality, accountability, um, and yeah. And so 
other, uh, here I'm switching gears a little bit, um, to, to point out interesting or important work that is happening to strengthen the science and policy interface. One is there's a lot of research going on and there's a new book um, on the implementation of this Moscow Fisheries Guidelines that has just been published. And as I mentioned, uh, in a week and a half, we're gonna have the Third World Congress on Moscow Fisheries in Thailand. We're also engaged in updating that data that I showed you initially, that is already a little bit dated. Um, and this is, this is research we're doing in collaboration with, with FAO and World Fish to update this research that was called Hidden Harvests. And so this update uh, that is much more than an update goes, we're calling it Illuminating Hidden Harvests. We're trying to link the contribution of small scale fisheries to sustainable development. And these are the economic, social and environmental contributions that small scale fisheries make. So this is the original study, Hidden Harvest 2012. Um, and now that we have the voluntary guidelines that are broad in the scope on fisheries, um, this study is, is, is very relevant because again, it will broaden the way we think and, and we create policy about small scale fisheries that will help or give information uh, to address important um, sustainable development goals like no poverty and, and zero hunger. Uh, we're welcoming, welcoming contributions or partners. Uh, and here's the email of the project manager uh, for illuminating hidden harvests in case of any of you want to know more about the project or, or, or partner with us. Uh, and so to finalize, governance is a key challenge to address common issues in small scale fisheries views among researchers of what is to govern and how to govern has shifted over time. Significant empirical research is taking place, but more is definitely needed involving fishers in the co-production of knowledge about the commons. Significant work is being done among practitioners. There's a lot of practitioners involved in the work on small scale fisheries and coastal environments, yet the funding levels are significantly lower than for other areas related to the ocean. The Small Scale Fisheries Guidelines provide a useful framework for policy and science engagement um, and the challenges in their implementation. And finally, Illuminating Human Harvest Project, the one I just mentioned, will produce new global and local empirical knowledge about the contributions of small scale fisheries to sustainable development goals, but we need your help. And so this was just a very broad and brief um, summary of some work and, and, and practice in relation to governance of small scale fisheries. Some of the materials are presented here. Um, you can find in the webpage of our um, collaboratory, Coast and Commons, uh, where we're focusing uh, a lot in work at the very local level in, in Mexico in particular, but at the regional global levels with some of the issues I mentioned here. So if you're interested in learning more, um, come and visit our, our collab. And with that, um, let's open it to questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was really great. Uh, I'm opening the floor for questions. So you can type your question or if you're calling us, with the phone is star nine, so you can raise your hands. So I have a question. Um, you were saying that uh, a lot of like the small scale has this huge industry and like employment of a lot of people. How do you see like that uh, political uh, changes in countries, for example, third world countries, influenciate this change of governance within like the small communities? So, so just question is your question how um, 
how better governing small-scale fisheries will influence the development of rural communities around the world? No, that... it's just like how uh, the political sphere and changes in political government would mm -hmm. influence the uh, engagement or like can be like uh, even impact positively or negative small-scale mm -hmm. fish fisheries. Have you looked at that at all? Yeah, no, um, a little bit. Uh, it's it's something always crosses uh, the minds of people who are working with small scale fisheries because uh, I think we need to start by acknowledging that, as I mentioned at the very beginning, a lot of them haven't been governed by by their governments. They've been governing themselves in the sense if we define governance as the agreements you 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 make with with other fishers to be able to to organize your interactions with with yourselves and with the environment small scale fisheries have been fishers have been governing themselves for a long time because they've been very far away whether it's geographically or psychologically from their national or regional governments so so it will be wrong to think that small scale fisheries because there's not the presence of government they haven't they haven't been governed governed right they they've been governing themselves for a long time in many cases um, and so what has happened like in many other commons is that the national government comes thinking that fishers do not know what they're doing or or these are these are environments that need to be governed and impose policies um, from the top down that as we know in many instances um, they're going to fail because they lack the, the local knowledge, um, the intimate knowledge you need to have about the environment and the social fabric in the place in order to get those rules to work well for most or for, um, for most people. And so, so in some instances, more attention to small scale fisheries has created more problems. In other instances, governments have been taking an approach of, of giving a voice to fishers and, and allow them to participate in governance and the creation of policies. So, so we see a, a mix of, of, of results and, or, or different um, outcomes in, in, in interaction with, with national or regional governments. Um, it's hard to say, you know, one, way or the other um, in general. Yeah, does that, does that help a little bit? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, and um, yeah, and I, I think what we see in small scale fishing um, is similar to other, to other place or other comments where, where the assumption that those authorities that are very far away has been that locals need to be told how to manage resources, you know, appropriately. But in many other places in the world that, that I've visited, um, these communities are so isolated that the governments haven't been, haven't had a, much of a presence yet. Um, and there you see very interesting examples of governance as well. Yeah. And Another question about the um, so like the social uh, structure of the small fishers communities. For example, do you see any um, how can I say that any organization within the other like not the fishers by itself, but the fish the fish workers, uh, women, and like everybody that. Is like the small scale part of selling the product and this organization within the women. Yeah, that's that's if we're talking about forgotten uh, yeah. here is like really really forgotten because um, I mean I I've made the mistake of just thinking fishing is just harvesting and fishing mm -hmm. you know and so all that labor that that is very gendered um, 
is not taking into account in policy, is not taking into account in 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 research, um, and yet is very important part of the fishing process. So, so fortunately. Um, my own students are interested in, in those issues and I see other students coming up interest, taking more an interest on, on those issues that have been ignored in the past. And so it's very encouraging to see the guidelines are taking on those issues and, and young researchers are starting to, you know, to research those previously ignored aspects of, of fishing and hopefully at some point we'll think of fishing beyond harvesting. But it's interesting in terms of, of our own um, work with common pool resources where, you know, common pool resources mostly has paid attention to the issue of harvesting because it's a very important problem to understand, but, but fishing in particular goes beyond harvesting. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask the audience any more questions? Let me just. So, I think I want to thank you so much, Javier, for your presence and giving this webinar so late at night for you. And it's a really great pleasure. Um, on behalf of the IASC and the, all the World of Commons Week uh, organizers, I'm like, thank you, all the attendees, our speaker. And I would like to make a few announcements before closing the webinar. In November, IASC is holding their first virtual conference. And the second point is like in July 2019, the IASC is holding its BNL in person conference in Lima, Peru, and the abstracts are open until November 15th. So everybody that's interested, I really invite you to apply for and also I would like to thank you again for your time and the great presentation and thank everybody that listened to this webinar.